you want more of the conventional wisdom on sales and growing revenue, this podcast isn't for you. Throw away your closing tactics, tricks, and tips, and learn what the top 1% income earners do to create results. This is the On Purpose Growth Podcast. All right, everybody. Welcome back to uh, the On Purpose Growth Podcast. My name is Brian McDonald, partner at uh, On Purpose Growth. And uh, the On Purpose Growth Podcast talks about mindset, strategies, techniques, um, anything that you need to grow, uh, learn to grow on purpose. And today I'm really excited to have uh, my new friend, Scotty Schindler, on. We, uh, we had met across uh, LinkedIn. I love all his content. And when I uh, dove a little deeper into who he was and his background, it was amazing. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm happy to have him on today. And, and Scotty, I, I appreciate you being here and uh, tuning in all the way from Australia. So we're, uh, we're, we're all across the globe on this one. Yeah, no, it's, it's early in the morning over here. I've, I've had my coffee. <laughs> awesome. So, uh, so you're a, uh, you know, a, uh, an entrepreneur who's um, sold a business, you know, more than once. You're a global speaker, a motivational speaker. We, I know we talked that, that your trade is sales. So we'll get into that. But why don't you give, um, you know, paint a picture of, you know, where you've come from, where you're at, and where you've come from, and, and give everybody a little bit of background. Sure, happy to do that. Um, depends how far back you want to go to, let's say, a teenager where, you know, I come from a pretty poor background, which isn't uncommon, but look, I came from a, yeah. a relatively poor background, mixed family, and I just wanted to achieve success. In fact, I wanted to be a professional surfer, but I, I never got to, to really get that opportunity because of the, you know, you need money to be able to travel and attend surfing competitions. So I decided I wanted to, you know, become a salesperson. And not many people, you know, you know I want to be a fireman and I want to be a policeman and I want to be a builder. I wanted to be a salesperson. And the reason why I wanted to be a salesperson because there was a guy around here that was a few years older than me who drove a brand new car. And I thought, now that's success. Mm. I want to be able to get a brand new car. So that's why I wanted to get into specifically real estate sales. And I wanted to become a real estate salesperson. So, and then I ended up selling insurance for 10 years and I did really well out of that. And it was business to business. So mm -hmm. uh, that's where I learned the trade of, you know, developing people, um, sales, uh, creating an environment for success. Because, you know, uh, when you're on a commission, if you don't, if you don't sell, you don't eat. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> you quit, you've got to go get another job. Right. So, but yeah, exactly. if you can make it, if you can make it doing door to door sales, I mean, you can make it. You're a salesperson. There's no doubt about it. You've got to have done more than two years, in my opinion, of door to door. You know, three months doesn't quite cut it. But yeah. if you've been door to door salesperson for two or more years and you've hung around, that means not only were you good at it, you've also had success at it and you've been able to grow and prosper. Well, I did it for 10 years. So I think I passed that, that trademark as far open. as being, being qualified sales, but I wouldn't have a go on my own. So I then stopped selling insurance and thought I'd start my own company with no idea how I was going to do or what I was going to do. The only thing I knew was it was going to be in IT. So Renet, which was the one that uh, I eventually got traction with after two years, uh, was my fifth attempt at starting a company. Wow. So my fifth attempt and then it grew, you know, it grew. And it, uh, I, I say I cheated because what I did was I could go down the street, walk into real estate agent offices and have them buy the product. And that's what made the company work. But I, you know, I was doing that with the other ones as well, but real estate just seemed to work. So I went, hey, this one's got the course of least resistance. I'm gonna follow this one. <laughs> yep. So that's what I did. Um, the other, you know, I had two that just didn't work out at all. The first one I did crumbled all together, but you know, in the end, that was all part of the journey of trying to identify yep. what I was gonna do and what product it was going to be. And that was very good. I really enjoyed that process at the time though, it was tough. It was really tough. But I got there. That's all that mattered. So you said at the time it was tough. Uh, what do you mean by that? Well, there was no money. So essentially, you know, I was very fortunate that, um, I mean, 10 years wasn't the reason why I left the insurance business to start my own. It was just the way it worked out. I was at the point where I went through a midlife crisis in my, my late 20s. I was 27. And I went, oh, this is, I just didn't enjoy who I was and I was fat and I wasn't having the lifestyle I wanted. And, and that's the reason why I, I quit. But I was fortunate in the sense that 
I, I, I managed to have two houses, but I didn't own them. But I, I, if I sold one house, I'd own the other. Mm -hmm. And that's so where I was fortunate was that I was uh, debt free. I was also income free because I quit my job and wanted to start. <laughs> So I was debt free, but income free. And I had to go and work out how to sell um, some of this new fancy stuff that was around at the turn of the century called websites. So I had to learn how to build websites and how to go and sell websites. But selling them was easy. I'd walk into any business and I could sell them. Then I'd go home for a few weeks, learn how to build these websites and try and establish what I wanted to do in all this IT world. Um, so it just took time to get any real money because I had to buy a computer, I had to buy software, I'd spend time investing learning because a lot of investment in knowledge at the time. Um, so there wasn't much money. So it was tough. It was tough for a while until I actually got that traction going. But I was adamant that I was going to build a product. There was one chapter though, just to give you a backstory. There's a chapter there at the end of 2000 or the start of 2001. I just can't remember. I think it was the start of 2001 mm -hmm. where I didn't think I could do it. I started to lose confidence and I started applying for jobs. And I thought, well, I'll apply for all these sales manager jobs and all these sorts of you know, jobs. But, you know, I never even, not only did I not get a job, I never even got an interview. Oh. I never even got an interview. I just was, and I went, oh, that's not real cool. So I, that was lucky because if I, if I had got a job, I never would have ended up on the journey I did and finding the company Renet. So I had to, because of, because of not getting even an interview or a job, I thought, well, these people obviously don't like me. I had to continue having a bet on myself. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did. So I was, I was blessed in the end, but at the time, it, it was tough. And there was no money and the wife was screaming at me and, you know. But I, was, I had a vision of what I wanted to create. And uh, it was only mud map, but yeah. So, so how did that, that kind of time frame help you? Right, I know, I know not getting the job helped you, yeah. but there's, I know there's other stuff there. Right, how did oh, this there's plenty of stuff there. You know, there was in building the company, I was traveling around in a, in a um, I'm not sure what you call a station wagon over there. They're probably still called station yeah, wagons. Station wagon. Yeah, yeah. Old one though. So I bought this old station wagon because I sold everything that I owned and I ended up just um, um, with an old station wagon. Mm -hmm. I used to sleep in the back of it to when I was on the road and then go showers down at the public showers and then go and see people and that's how I started. And, um, you know, so when I say, you know, I actually enjoyed that part of it because it was the tough part, but I actually enjoyed it because it was like me going out and doing the extra mile and doing all the things that were required. And there's a level of satisfaction in doing that too. Mm -hmm. uh, there was, I could give you a hundred stories, but people want to learn about other things, I guess. Yeah. So, so <laughs> what's the, what's the payoff to all this? Like wh where did you land? Well, yeah, like in the end, in the end, the, um, I created the company called Renet and that happened in February, 2002. So that was almost two years to the day of when I um, resigned from the insurance business. Okay. So then I, I went around and I just went door knocking, selling more and more of the real estate software. And then in the end, I business started growing really well in 2003. So I had to start duplicating myself and that's when I started hiring staff. And I realized I had a company, but as I started 2004, so it took another two years for me to really have a company mm -hmm. where it wasn't just me. I had uh, multiple staff and so on. And by 2006, you know, I grew that to uh, eight staff and, you know, business was coming in on a regular basis and we were growing and we were now known as one of the people in the industry as a product. And, and that just continued on over the course of, you know, the next 10 years till the point of 2015, I started thinking, well, you know, am I the right person now to, to be at the helm of this company as it goes forward and be really aggressive with the next chapter? Or do I get an investor in? And if I get the investor in, do I um, go on a journey with someone else's money and no risk? <laughs> but I didn't know what the answer was. So in the end, I went that I went to the, I went to a merchant banker. He then went to market to, there's only a handful of people that want to buy that kind of product. Um, or service to add it into theirs as a major company. Mm -hmm. and we, did. we ended up finding someone to, to come in and buy the business and hopefully go on the next chapter, which was a lot of fun. And that was in 2015. I then on sold it and started working for the company. And then three years later, they on sold it again. So I simply yeah. retired. So I was financially independent and that was it. Job done. Job done, right? Job done. <laughs> and, I mean, and now you're on to the new journey. 
uh, want to explain yeah. what you're up to now. And then we'll dive cool. into the sales stuff. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, cool. So essentially, the um, I guess the journey I'm on right now with the, the speaking and the mentoring and the advising and even just putting out the videos and the content wasn't something I planned on doing a year ago or 18 months ago. I was happy to go surfing. But what happened was people started asking me to come and do this talking. So I've, and I've always done it. That's all I've done is stand up in front of groups and do workshops or, you know, speak and run courses and do all those sorts of things. So I went, yeah, sure. And I'm actually really enjoying it. So what's changed now, what's been the pivot is uh, not only am I not dealing with domestic in Australia and New Zealand and real estate industry, I'm now dealing with all sorts of businesses across the world and sharing all my knowledge. So where the pivots come from is I underestimated how much impact mm. I could have across that such broad range of stuff. So I've now got an extra stride in my step about you know finishing my books that I want to write and speaking in front of everyone and sharing the lessons and the stories and, and motivating others and watching that stride in their step. It's, it's, I underestimated just how good that would feel. So yeah, it's been good. That's great, man. And, and, and I'm, I'm glad to catch you at this part of your journey because uh, it's, it's exciting to, to, to see somebody uh, take off like that in uh, you know, a, a second direction, right? You've had a bunch of success already and now it's you know, gonna uh, manifest itself again in another area. So, um, so, but, so when we talked before, you explained that, yeah, you ran businesses and it was in, in technology, but, but really your craft is sales. Tell, tell, me, tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah, sure, 100%. If I, very few people are proud to say it, but if I had to give a trade, yeah. my actual trade is as a salesperson. You know, some people did, you know, they were a builder or they were an electrician or they were a baker or a butcher or something else, right? And then they pivot later on. Well, my, my trade was selling not only selling, but teaching sales. So mm. I could teach people how to sell. Now, obviously, if, if, the better you are, the easier it is to teach. Yep. So, um, so, yeah, that's, that's my trade. Most people probably wouldn't openly say I'm a salesperson, but that is my trade. And, and some people ask me, oh, my son or daughter wants to get into IT. What should they do? And I go, learn sales. You know? yeah. But un unfortunately, those trades aren't there anymore. And I often talk to people about it. That, you know, the old trades of door-to-door -door are gone. You know, there's no longer door-to-door -door encyclopedias or door-to-door -door vacuum cleaners or, you know, there's very little door-to-door -door anymore. So people don't have that opportunity mm -hmm. to go and learn craft and art. And if you go door-to-door, -door, I mean, you've, you've really got to learn how to open people's minds and do a presentation and walk out with some money or else you're not going to eat. So you've really got to learn the craft of being nice to people, opening their mind and having them buy into you and the product. Mm -hmm. You've got to learn that craft. So... So how did, how did you learn that craft? Just from the, well, it was actually an American insurance company that I worked for. So I loved it. They did all the rah, rah stuff and all the motivational stuff, but they also did lots of training. So to be honest, you know, it was where I learned the most was when I got promoted into management and then I had to teach. So not only did I have to do, I also had to teach, which meant that I also had to understand. Mm. So there's a big difference about knowing and there's a big difference about understanding what is actually happening. So the more you do it, the more it becomes second nature. So the more you can actually look back at, well, when I say these things at certain times, when I do these actions and the reactions I get, you know, the more you understand the psychology behind everything, obviously the easier it is and the better it becomes. But I had to really sit back and analyze the why, not just what we were doing, but why and why it worked. Um, because I started teaching and, and I guess, um, creating an environment for other people to come in and become successful salespeople as well. So that's what made the difference was what, you know, I, I started getting into this senior management roles, you know, after four, five, six years. And then I started to really understand the psychology behind selling. And how, I mean, how much time did you spend on this? Cause it doesn't sound like it was, you know, a couple books, right? <laughs> no, no, it was, it was oodles and oodles. It was just oodles. Um, yeah. And that was just, that was it. That was my life for 10 years. You know, yeah, working 80 hours a week for me has been something I've done forever. Now, that might be an exaggeration some weeks, but I can tell you it didn't feel like it. You know, 60-hour weeks were just normal. Um, and I didn't mind it because being on commission, the, the longer I worked, the better it was. So, you know, I got up early in the morning. 
Um, I'd go out to late at night. Then I had to come back and do the book work and get organised for the next day, come up with my plans. And then in the end, not just for me, but for the team. Mm -hmm. uh, there was one period there when I was selling insurance. I didn't have a holiday for four years. I worked yeah. straight through for four years to set myself up. And uh, that was what I liked about it. I really liked that side of it. I could just pick a run and just go for it and work really hard if I wanted to. Mm -hmm. When I bought my first house, I didn't, I didn't take into account what's called stamp duty in Australia. So you buy a house, there's a tax they put on top of that purchase of the house. Yep, yep. At the time, like five, I think it was five and a half grand at the time. So this is 1994, so it was a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Probably, to, relative speaking, 20 or 30,000 now. Yeah, right. Well, wow, I had, I had four weeks to make five and a half grand because I spent all my money on the deposit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so I, I literally worked seven days a week for that four weeks. I didn't quite make enough money. I then had to stretch out the, the actual transaction by another 10 days before I could get the money. So I just worked my butt off. And that was one of the benefits of being on commission. So if I wanted to go and work seven days a week, yep. 10 o'clock at night, I could. I wasn't. Uh, um, I saw a motivational quote oh, last year. It just so resonated with me. Yeah, that, that um, I can't remember exactly how it starts, but I'll give you the punchline. Yep. So I'll relate it to me. I worked. 80 hours a week, so I didn't have to work 40 hours a week. Yeah, yeah, I got it. I'm with you. I'm with you on that one, right? I didn't want to have to work 40. I wanted to have as much opportunity as I could. And, uh, and that same mindset was what I put into my company. So I gave my staff all bonuses. If they wanted to come in on Saturday and go the extra mile, they all got bonuses. Every single staff member in my company was on bonuses. Now, they had a base salary because it was a company and it was actually a salary business, but they all got bonuses. So anyone that worked at night time, three o'clock in the morning, can't sleep, got up and did some programming or, or got up and did some emails, did some extra work. It was all because they were getting bonus for everything they did. So the extra miles got extra money. And that's part of the, part of the company philosophy as I went forward. That's, that's great because I, I think that's important because the, um, it even goes back to all the work that you put in to understanding, knowing and doing are two different things, right? Man, those those who can do. Yeah, there you go. Right, <laughs> because we're, we're we're surrounded by so much information that I think people are losing. That, like, if I just get that information, then I'm good. But the the, uh, I mean, you probably saw that on your sales teams that you know there was there was people that did, and then there was people that just you know got the information and did nothing with it. Oh, absolutely. Um, it's a, a little bit called um, CPD, car park disease. So, you know, they might get a little car park disease. Car park, okay. So they, they go and get a little bit of success and they get a few runs on the board mm -hmm. and they may even go, and maybe this, this, this may happen to where, um, they, as an example, they end up, you know, start to buy another car and they start to do, because they've been in for a year or two and things are going really well. This could be in any company in any sort of stage. But instead of going doing all the things they did that made them successful and, and learning and growing and, and getting everything to the next level, they start to actually just stand around all day in the car park with their flash cars or, or at the coffee shop nowadays, sitting in the coffee shop with their laptop. Instead of going and talking to people and going doing all those things they did to get going. And, um, you know, there's a lot of people that, have read the books and, and, and can recite books like this. Yeah, they can recite books like this quote for quote. Now, I can't give all quotes quote for quote, but I actioned them. I can tell yeah. you that. And, um, but some people are beautiful at it, but they, 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 they can't action them. Some people just, just they parrot fashion, give you all the right answers. But there's other people that don't seem as talented, but they go out and they do everything they can. Mm -hmm. And they succeed. And that's what it's all about. It's about the action. Not the knowledge. Knowledge is useless without action. Yeah, I mean, do, do you think it's about who you are constantly becoming? Is that, is that part of the process? Always be improving. I actually did an article on it, the ABI index. You know, you always be improving index. And mm -hmm. um, it doesn't matter where you are or what you're doing. If you're constantly striving for improvement, you've constantly got goals in front of you, you've got satisfaction you're getting, you've also got some disappointment. You have to have those because not yeah. everything goes for you. Um, but yeah, your ABI index always be improving. And <clears throat> so under that context of always been improving and, and you have challenges, how did you, 
what type of learner were, were you? Like, how did you learn from things not going the right way or, or things actually going the right way? You know, it's a good question. Um, people often ask me how I overcame adversity and fear and things like that. And it was often, it was more about my uh, willingness to learn sometimes was not as good as it should have been. And it wasn't until things went really bad that I went and I had to have those epiphany moments where I go, no, nah, I've, I've got to focus and I've got to do what I need to do or I've got to quit and change or do something like that. But I tried not to be a quitter. Um, you know, I've sort, of, I've sort of only had three careers, which was one I made windows for a year out of school, mm -hmm. so um, house windows. And then I sold insurance for 10. And then I was, the, was, I guess, the software company owner for 18 years. So, you know, I've only had three. And now I'm sort of, I guess, speaking and things like that. But I tried not to be a quitter, but it was when, it, when all things went wrong, like when I had a car accident and, you know, when all the things weren't right, that made me go and have those epiphany moments in life. Um, same as the midlife crisis I went on in 27 years of age. I was like, well, you know, things weren't really well for me, but that's when, that's when things actually turn. Um, I have a saying that I live by, and I don't use it much, but seeing as though you've asked, you know, and, and unfortunately, the easiest way to learn is the hard way. Oh, gosh, I love it. It's so true, right? Has been for me. Yeah, uh, me too, right? It's, it, uh, the, the, I actually have learned to embrace when things are going bad that actually this is what I'm supposed to be going through to actually make that change, right? It, the, the perception of it just clicks, right? You, you, it's almost guaranteed that if this really sucks, it's something's good going to be on the other end. I don't know what it is, but it's going to be, uh, it's going to be good on the other end. Yeah, everything goes in cycles, just like the ocean with surfing, you know, it comes and goes, comes and goes. Everything in life goes in rhythms as well, you know, so you'll have your good years and the years that you would really much rather you didn't have. But out of those years, that's when you reassess and reevaluate and you reset goals and redefine who you are. And, and often people pivot in those years and become completely different to five years ago to five years time. Yeah. So how did you apply all this to, to sales and teaching sales teams and growing, you know, any organization that you had? Yeah. Well, um, what do you mean by this though? Define this. Yeah. Great question. So, um, helping salespeople understand this principle to go get more sales. Yeah, so, all right. so when it came down to when I first wrote the real estate software, <clears throat> the first version of it was, um, it just allowed agents to put their listings online onto their own website. Okay. And I had this control panel that allowed them to put the photos up, put the descriptions up, and it went onto their website plus some advertising ports. But with a very short period of time, I, I listened to feedback from the clients and they started asking me for things to do with uh, customers, some, the, the contact management, the CRM side. And that's when it became a real solution. And what I then did was, you know, I, I just looked at my software. If I was a real estate salesperson, how's this going to save me time or make me money? And then once I created that product, all I then did was teach salespeople how to become better salespeople because I understand the process they're going through. I understand what they're doing. And this is how you can use the product to achieve twice as much in half the time. So having that skill set of sales allowed me to understand what they were doing in their processes, but also allowed me to present it in such a way that they'd buy into the process quite easily because they go, yeah, this works. Um, so I was selling them, even though they were already clients, but I still had to continually sell people on mm -hmm. the benefits of using the software to its, to its full potential, because that's not easy. A lot of people have got software in their computers that they don't ever use. So no different for ours. You know, someone, the boss might buy it because he thinks it's good, but you know, he's got eight or 10 staff. Mm -hmm. And the better everyone uses it, the better the software is and the more attached they became. Because I never had any contracts with the software. There was no contracts, no obligation. Oh, really? back then was really fresh and rare. No one did that. But I went, well, if I've either got a company or I don't. I've either got clients or I don't. I need to know that, you know, this is actually working because they like the product and they want to keep paying for the product, not because they're obliged to pay for the product. And that was the model I had the whole time. So no contracts. Now it's not uncommon. People pay monthly. There's software as a service, as it's called. But none of that was around when I started in 2000. They didn't have those terms. 
So, <laughs> in fact, software as a service, I, when I first started, I was going to become an ASP. Did you, did you have ISPs over there, internet service providers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I was going to become an ASP, an application service provider. That's what it was called at the turn of the century. Hmm. You know, so they were application service providers. And then that got swapped out in hmm. 2010 when everyone started calling it software as a service when they started doing monthly fees and things like that. So, and I went, well, I've been doing that already for years. That's fine. Yeah. I can run with now. Now I'm a SaaS provider. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, who cares? <laughs> I don't care what you call me. So oh, it's the cloud. I used to call it internet based software. Oh, cloud. Cool. <laughs> right. <I'm> <laughs> so, it's what it sounds like, though, is. Uh, is you really understood how to live in your customer's process and then apply that to the sales process. Oh, absolutely. The lived in the sales, in the, uh, in the life of the customer, and then you taught salespeople how to sell against that. Yeah, correct. And the other thing was I wasn't scared to be on the coal face. I mean, I, for me, it was like, compared to selling insurance, when I was selling the real estate software, the saying I used it was like selling lollies to kids. It was easy. I mean, I just, I was just like, in fact, I had to, you didn't even have to sell. So I just walk in and start talking and presenting it. And because it was so natural for me and the market was ready for it, it was just, uh, I won't say it was easy because there are, there was competition around Yeah. and they weren't doing what I was doing. So I went, I went out door to door to these real estate agents, physically knocked on their door, walked in, created a presentation and walked out with a check. And that's how I grew the business. That's how I knew I had a company. And I spent, nine months of 2003 traveling um, through the east coast of Australia and just physically going into these um, large rural uh, country towns, you know, there's 75,000 people or so, and going in and knocking on the doors of all the real estate agents. I, I skipped the city, so I didn't go to Sydney and I didn't go to Brisbane. I went to all these major areas because I knew no one else was going to them to start with. Mm. You know, all the city people go to the city. They don't go to the country very often. So I went to the country. They were, they were easy to deal with. They paid the same money as the city people and they really appreciated what I was doing, which meant, like I said, it was like someone loved these to kids. It was just easy. I could walk in the door, walk out with a check and have a really satisfied customer. You know, but I never knocked on a door after September 2003. I didn't knock on another door. That was it. Didn't have to. The business had had momentum by then. But I went through from, from January um, 2002 till September 2003, I constantly went out knocking on doors to grow the business. But, and what it sounds like to me is, well, well, what sounds like to me is you went and you did something in areas where no one else was because there was less competition and you were, you were ready to put the effort in that nobody else was. Yeah, I was definitely willing to put the effort in. I was, I was 100% when I left the insurance business going to have a bet on myself. 100%. Ah. And I was prepared to do whatever it takes. Um, not knowing what, and I really didn't have a clear vision. Now, some people have got these business plans and they've got before they ever start the company and they, they well, I didn't have any of that. <laughs> I just went out and started growing this company and let the, the, the customers tell me what they wanted. So all I did was listen to them because I don't have a computing programming degree or anything like that. All I had was the, the knowledge I'd learned, self-taught from, from making websites and building databases in the end. All I had was the ability to listen to clients and say, well, what do you want? What, what else do you want in the product? And then I'd go back and I'd make more of that product. I'd be up at night, three o'clock in the morning, punching out more code, making it a little bit better. Not only did it make it better for those clients, it made it better for me to walk in the door of the next real estate office and go, look at all the features we've got. So <laughs> it was this, was this perpetual motion of growth and satisfaction and momentum. It was a good time. Yeah, it's, we talk a lot about that in regards to being able to, uh, to listen to, to client and prospect feedback and making iterations based on that because they, because it doesn't matter what you think is great. The only thing that matters is, is what they think is great. Uh, yeah. and making those iterations and, and, and you're not going to use that to differentiate yourself. What it sounds like is you, you combine that with, you know, everybody's going to spend time in the big cities. So I'm going to spend time where, you know, nobody else is. Uh, and you had more than one, way to differentiate yourself, right? Yeah, and you know, I did end up getting the clients in the cities, don't get me wrong, they ended up finding out about who I was, but they came to me. Exactly. So they came to me and said, well, can you tell me more about the product? Because the product was around, it was everywhere, you know? So even when I was knocking on doors, I was getting leads off real estate agents, because you know, it's one of the things you do is you ask for leads. You know, people in Tasmania, which is, you know, miles away, and people in Perth, 
you know, I never went to Perth once to sell a product. Wow. But I got in referrals and I pick up the phone. Nowadays with Zoom, it's so much better. But, you know, I got, I got all those referrals and I asked for those referrals because people met each other at conferences and, oh, you should use this software and all that sort of stuff. So I got a lot of referrals. And that's why in the end, by September 2003, I didn't have to knock on any doors anymore. Not that I didn't want to, I just didn't have to. I had enough leads coming through every week to, to manage the business. And the business was about sustainable, manageable and profitable growth at all times. I didn't want to be the biggest company in two years. I wanted to be a great company over 10. And that was just a mindset that I had. Um, so yeah, that's, I guess there's different ways to skin a cat, but that's how I looked at it. But, so how, how did you apply that? Because I love that. I mean, I, we're big proponents of that too, is um, not making it explode. That one of the worst things you can do is make something explode. Uh, but but you sounds like you, you, you grew your sales in a very purposeful way. Um, tell me more about well, that. And, and also, when you come down to the creating the product, you know, from feedback, so listening to what the clients want, mm -hmm. that did two things for me. So first off, well, it improved the product. So if I thought it was a good idea and the client thought it was a good idea, I'd just do that because it gave me something that meant the client got what they wanted. So I managed to lock that client in and they'd be with me for the next few years, no contract. Okay? So they'd be happy. Mm -hmm. um, then it also gave me, as I said earlier, something extra to sell. Now, because I didn't have any contracts, um, I really needed a way of creating an environment for clients to stay with me and feel like we were always improving and things like that. In the end, I can't remember the year I started to change it, but in the end, people would ask me for improvements. Now I'd be charging them for it. Yep. <laughs> now that's, that's perfect business judo there. So not only was it a win-win uh, situation, I was now getting paid to get better ideas into the software. So things grow and continue to prosper and so on, but you've got to be careful what you take on too. So if it was a, it was something that someone wanted, but it was only good for them, you know, I'd, I'd literally say, well, look, how about you kick the tin for say $1,000 or $2,000 and I'll get it done for you. And that was my way of then qualifying whether they really wanted it or yeah. whether it was something that was a good idea that they might never use anyway. Because there was a lot of good ideas that could stall you. Um, but most of the good ideas became products that I could uh, implement and improve. You know, I had one guy give me a really good idea and the, the guy didn't even end up using that idea, but the software grew because of it. And it was simply something to do with the way we manage the touch points of clients. Um, and other people, I had a guy that started with us in a real estate office. So he went through the journey of three real estate offices to 26 real estate offices. But he, he gave me a really good idea about all the data and creating this chronological history report about everything that's ever happened with a, a contact. So I did the same thing for, for people, I did the same thing for staff, and I did the same thing for properties. And that report is still unique in the industry today, the way we do it. And that was way back in like maybe 2005. He rang me up on the phone one day, he said, no, it'd be a really good idea, a report that does this. And I went, actually, that's, that's easy. It looked really complicated, what it did, but it was really easy. And other times people would ask me just for a tick box, and I'd be going, well, to put that tick box in is simple, but I've got to change the database. I've got to change the API. I've got to change the way it prints. I've got to change the way it synchronizes with third parties. I've got to change, and it like, could be a week or a month's work because it's a tick box. You know, and other tick boxes weren't, but clients didn't know the difference between what tick box did what and what effect it actually had. And other things were easy. So does that answer your question? Yeah, no, no, that's, uh, that, that's, that's great. I, I, I love that because there you were doing – it sounds like to me that you have a very specific way to basically bring in information and say, okay, that's good. I can use that. Or yeah, that's a good idea, but I'm not going to do that. Right. It's, uh, uh you, you really picked and choose uh, I did. what you're going to do. And that was client retention. That's how I, that's how I kept clients loyal. Um, and I never said no. I just said, I would say things like, well, look, I think that's a great idea, but I'm, I, I can't get to it for a, for a, a little while so come back to me in a month or two and I'll, I'll do it for you then because that also qualified them if they came back in a month or two yeah yeah right they're serious enough right, <laughs> serious about it, right? or I might have got it done or someone else might ask it or I ask other clients what do you think of this idea so I qualify it but that was my client retention so that was how my product growth and client retention was around that so one of the proudest things I've got is you know when I when I finished with the company my first 20 real estate offices I ever sold to were all still clients, except for a couple that had closed down and so on. In fact, if you do it by the number of offices, because some had grown too, 
I had still my first 20 officers, I still had 20 officers that were the same when I exited the company. They stayed loyal with me the whole time through server outages and all those things that went wrong, right? Um, I, I'm not going to go to all the negative things, but through all the things that could go wrong, I had my share of all of them, right? And yeah, mail servers, websites, everything everything goes down. Everyone has their turn of, of IT not working the way it's supposed to. And I had my fair share, I can tell you that. Um, so, you know, they were all still clients. And that loyalty was non-contracted. It was only because they got what they wanted. So how, so this is really interesting. Uh, uh, this, this is a really interesting sales skill that you just kind of glanced over there. And how did you keep these people? Because, you know, once, once you get a client, you, you're still selling them to keep them. So through all of those, you know, servers down and, and whatever happened, how did you, uh, how did you keep them? Well, I guess I had a real uh, empathy for the fact they were clients and they were loyal. So every time something went wrong, you know, I made sure I corresponded with them and I, I would send out emails. And when you've got thousands of them, you can't pick up the phone and talk to them. Yeah, right. You know, so look, when the server goes down, can't you just ring me? I'm going, well, not really, because right now I'm busy. <laughs> <laughs> right now I'm trying to fix the server and get it up and running. I'm not sure if it's going to be five minutes or five hours, but we're onto it, right? And the only thing I, the only thing I could, and I'd email them all and say thanks and explain what happened and, um, every now and then it was our fault, but often it wasn't. And, you know, with the internet, it changed a lot between, say, 2000 and 2010, where mm -hmm. it was just open and free and loving in 2000 to where security was a massive issue. People were hacking and they were trying to do denial of service attacks and crawlers. People were writing their own crawlers and just killing your servers. And even if it wasn't a denial of service attack, it was just then just overload everything, right? So, anyway. So, all I could do was write to them and say, look, this is what happened. Um, we, we try to deal with the knowns that are going to happen, but there's the unknown unknowns that we just don't know what's going to happen. And, and as it grows so fast, all I can tell you is that we're on top of it. And I guarantee that we, we don't like it happening and we're going to do what we can to stop it happening in the future. Um, and sometimes we've got to capacity on servers, but all of a sudden that happens overnight, poof, bang, all of a sudden you got to put some new ones in. So I just, I just had to keep the relationship open with all these clients and be very, um, I guess humble and, and appreciative of their business rather than just dictating to them and telling them. So rather than treating clients like a pilot who mm -hmm. sits at the front, tells people what's going on, now sit back, shut up, enjoy the ride. No, I actually treated them like a hostess where I was out actually with them all the time and I was talking to them and so on. So I, was never, I never ran the business like a pilot. I ran the business like the hostess. And that was how I ran the businesses. And that kept client retention. And when things did go bad, I guess it was a lot easier for them to, to swallow the pill and continue on knowing that I was there talking to them as well. The other thing I did a lot too was um, when I first started, there was a thing called viral marketing. And I think that term's actually disappeared. I'm not sure, but viral marketing. So what I tried to do was make sure that I had a reason to be in front of these people every day. So I wanted to have some sort of correspondence from Renet going to them every day some sort of email alert, something that reminded them that we were there. Even if they didn't use the software every day themselves, I needed them to know the software was there to help them every day. Plus, I tried to do a software update release um, on a regular basis. So every week or two or three, there'd be software updates where I give them a list of all the recent improvements we've done to keep them actively involved in what's going on. So I, I tried to really make sure they were a part of the journey and they weren't just clients. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, it sounds like you were there to serve and not to sell. Oh, exactly. And we talk about selling, but, you know, uh, we, we, the reality is as salesmen, we don't sell nothing. People buy from us and they have to, have to appreciate what they get from us. And that in itself is an art, you know. Um, and it is definitely, yeah, it's, it's not marketing, you know, it's, it's sales. And, and mm -hmm. sales is, and, and it's just a matter of understanding how those sales are going to fit in to what you're doing. And for me, it was about selling people on a, on a long journey. So the value of a client over three or five or 10 years, and like I said, in some people's cases, 18 years, was actually a massive return on investment. And it was so much easier, you know, the old 80-20 rule was so much easier to keep those clients happy and have them buy more products and services of me than it was to go and find a new client. So I had to make sure that, you know, it's a false positive if you're not looking after your clients. Mm -hmm. It's a false positive. If you think if you're getting sales, but you're churning them out the back door, exactly. You've got to be able to, you've got to be able to keep retention on clients, and that's just the way it is. And and it sounds like <clears throat> you were very 
you know, with your humility and being humble, you were very transparent about what was going on. When issues came up, you faced them right away. It's, it's like the, um, you didn't act like nothing was going on that you, you hedged it prior to them getting upset. Yeah. And, um, and when our servers go down, we can't even notify them. We can't even say it's going down. So the phone would go nuts and the girls would be answering the phone going, oh, well, you know, yeah, it's down and yada yada and copping it sweet. Um, and some clients were really, oh, yeah, all right, well, as long as you know, was, you know, we're happy that you know and you're onto it. But that's, yeah, it was, it was, that was some of the toughest times I had where the servers went down. They were just horrible, horrible times. Was that, would it go on for days or hours? Uh, or? Hours, yeah. I mean, if it was, I think the longest one we had was, I don't know, but no, but to tell you the truth, it wasn't even half a day. It might have been like eight hours or something. We had a mail server go down once where it did go for where we lost a lot of it. We didn't actually lose any data, but the, the drive itself crashed and the, and, the backup, and the backup drive didn't kick in properly. So I had to actually jump in a plane. I was in Darwin I, and, and our office is an hour away from Sydney, but it's six hours drive. There's a, there's a computer scientist guy down in Sydney that'll go and extract all the data properly. So I flew from Darwin down to City, met a, met a guy that also flew because it was in the end quicker just to fly him down first thing in the morning. I drove to this scientist guy. He, he unpacked everything, gave me the drive. I flew back home. We plugged it in. Everything was back up by about four o'clock in the afternoon. So that was about 12 hours of just the mail server. But if he hadn't have been able to get in and get that data extracted and bring it back, yeah, we, I don't know what would have happened. But anyway, it worked out. It worked out. It worked out. <laughs> it all matters, right? It was like, oh, yeah, the only thing that matters. What do we do now? Because we don't ever want that to happen again. You know, so <laughs> so uh, what are some of the, uh, the best things that, that you feel you've passed on to your sales teams uh, for them to understand how to be successful? Why don't we share a little bit of that? Sure. Uh, look, apart from the standard things like goal setting, I constantly train my sales team um, on how to give better presentations. And, I, if I start talking about things now, I'm going to go for a couple of hours. So, so I'll probably have to get you to ask me questions, or else I'm just going to go in and off and sure. start doing a sales start doing a sales workshop here. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to do a sales workshop, but certainly understanding uh, my sales team about their presentation. So I did a lot of role play with them about what they were presenting and how they were presenting, and listening and learning, just like I did when I was teaching how to sell insurance um, with insurance help, I physically went with them down the street and watched what they did. And then we'd come back and, and tweak it a bit. But you know, most of these guys work remotely and I only did a few um, field calls and they were a bit more experienced. But you know, understanding you know, the four levels of the human mind, understanding the, the three reasons why we ask questions, um, the Socrates successful method and constantly teaching and training on all these things make a big difference. And even just the way they write things in emails. So getting their emails, having a quick look, but I'm not doing it because I want to interrogate them. I'm doing it because I want them to close more deals. Mm -hmm. And and because I know that we have the ability to, to keep these clients satisfied, but if they say the right things and they do the right actions and the right follow-up, their chances of closing more deals was a lot higher. So I, I constantly did a lot of training on those sorts of things. So, um, what 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 did you see the trending that people were doing in their presenting in their emails that they had to pivot on? Uh, any anything? Um, what you find is all salespeople do the same thing. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> they're, they're, they're all the same. Whether it be car salesperson or a, or a real estate salesperson or, or my guys, and often the way they ask questions is really really poor. Where most people fall down is in question asking, um, and Rather than give an example of my guys, I'll give you an example of someone that just did this to me recently. Okay. I was nearly going to have this lady help me fit out a new office. I've just started a little project for training and things like that. So I've just bought another building and I've fitted it out. Anyway, she was going to be the designer and she, her quote was $10,000 to do the designing. And I thought, I really like this lady and I really like what she's saying. But when, when she left, I just left it with, look, I can't promise it. I am going to have a look around and, um, but I'll get back to you. And it was something to that effect. And she turned around and her whole demeanor changed in the sense that she went, well, all right, well, I'll let you get back to me. And I'm going, well, that wasn't quite what I expected to happen next. 
I mean, this is a ten thousand dollars sale, right? And I'm there. I'm ninety nine percent there. I'm 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 no longer. She's taking me from her cold zone into a warm zone. I'm right on the cusp of a hot zone as a client, right? I'm right there. And for her to walk away going, well, I'll let you get back in contact with me was like, well, hang on a minute. Uh, I'm the customer here. <laughs> You're supposed to now help me. Obviously, obviously, I wasn't quite in the hot zone. I was in a warm zone. I was. It's her job now to continue to keep me in the warm zone. She just threw me straight back to the cold zone. <laughs> she threw me out. Now you get back to me. I'm going. Well, hang on a minute. That's not how it works. And and salespeople are the same the world over. And and understanding when they do that and the fact that it happens and the reasons and um, the the techniques to stop that from happening are just constant things that people need to learn and understand. It's just a constant thing. Um, and that happens the world over. It just it's just constant. And I guess no one's ever perfect. All right. So I'm sure I've done it from time to time too. But I bet 99 percent of the time I. I've got it right of and, and wrong. And, and that's an example of what she did. So she threw me back into the cold zone when I was actually right on the cusp of the hot zone and saying, let's go ahead. I just wanted to check a couple of things before I said yes. And, um, and that's a constant thing. So my guys would do the same sorts of things. You know, um, whether, let's say an email, and they'd write and say, well, you, um, if you've got any questions, get back to me. Well, that's not really, that's not really how it works. Yeah, no. What you do as a salesman, you say, "Look, I'll come back to you next week, and I'll give you some more information." Because you're keeping the you're keeping the dream alive. You're keeping them in the warm zone. You're constantly keeping some conversation, making positive statements. It's the pipeline and your follow up is part of the process. It's just the way it is. So you know these things are constant in any field, in any industry, on how people do it. I gave my phone number to a car salesperson last week. Sorry, two weeks ago. Still waiting for him to ring me back. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, really. I walked into the I walked into the car yard. I wanted to test drive one of the cars, and uh, he said, "Oh no, look, it's out." He said, "It'll be back Wednesday," and uh, so that's why I know it's two weeks ago because it was the Monday. And I waited for him to ring me, and I thought, "Well, anyway, maybe he's waiting for me to ring so that way he can maybe get a better deal or something." But I'm thinking, "Well, why wouldn't you yeah. pick up the phone?" Right. Mm -hmm. Pick so, up the phone. I mean, I walked into his warm zone. Right. In the car yard. Physically give him a number. I didn't shoot him one of those dumb emails. I physically walked in to give him the opportunity to sell me on why I should buy that brand over that brand. So what is it? So, so to me, this is a mindset that causes people to go in that direction. What, what do you think uh, it is with that mindset? Or what do you think that mindset is that people have to change and, and just make that shift? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe... Look, with the car, with the car salesperson, maybe he was busy. Maybe he'd already sold 10 cars that day and I was the low priority because I wasn't the one going in. I want, I want to buy, right? So maybe that was the case. So the mind shift comes, I guess, when, when um, people need the money. <laughs> but then I guess they get desperate. But, the, you know, if you're hungry and you need, you need the sales, I guess you'll do more things to nurture them. When you're in a position where things are really busy, you probably do less things you know, because you don't need them. In other words, you make people hungry to buy rather than you hungry to sell. But at the same time, uh, what happens with salespeople is they tend to get the CPD, the car park disease. You know, <laughs> so this, sales, this salesperson, for example, you know, maybe he was having a good month, but what happened to him putting me in his pipeline for this month? Mm -hmm. Now, if you really want to buy the car, you've got to ring me. No, that's <laughs> not, how, not really how it works. You know, and even so, I could have been a really easy sale. Because I really wanted one of those cars. I wanted to test drive it. Um, what do you do? And same as that lady. I mean, I, she'd already gone through the effort and energy of coming out, walking through the presentation and spending an hour with me and doing all those right things. She'd done everything right. And for that 1%, mm -hmm. it cost her 99% of her time. Yeah. And it was as simple as, all right, Scott, look, how about I get back to you next week and, and we'll catch back up. I mean, she only lived 10 minutes from where I was. She could have said, all right, well, how about we catch up again next Wednesday and we'll go over it. Right. What's wrong with that? It's a simple thing. What, what changes that mindset? Look, it's, I, it's either um, her doing that 10 times, realizing she just lost $100,000 worth of business. Because 10 times $10,000 is $100,000. That's a lot of money. And if you do that for the next 10 years, that's a million bucks extra you got in your kicker. It's a lot of money, right? That's so... So it's, it's either her realizing that she's losing all that money and making her think, well, hang on a minute, I better start nurturing these people a little bit better. Um, or she has a paradigm shift or she goes to a sales course or, or something happens. So 
But how do you get people to understand that? I guess is they, they've got to understand themselves first. So they've got to have that paradigm shift themselves. And like I said, it's adversity that makes that happen. Yeah. Not normally. I mean, it's when she gets to where she's struggling and going, well, how come I'm not making any money? Mm -hmm. I'm spinning my wheels. What, what do I change? That she'll start to either pick up a book, listen to a podcast, she'll watch some videos and have that paradigm shift herself. And she'll probably kick herself going, man, I could have got that sale if I'd have just done that. Man, I could have got that business if I'd have got that. Man, I could have done that if I'd have done that. And she'll go through those, oh, 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 I really messed those ones up moments. And every salesperson does that when they go and do a sales course and they go, ah, then they start to understand. And it's the understanding, remember, not just the action. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And what yeah. I'm going to do is, is as salespeople, we need to lead the people we're serving. And, and sometimes it's like, okay, like it, they say, you know, you're saying, you know, um, let me think about this. It's like, okay, like let's, let's talk next week or um, be, a, be a little bit more assertive to either, uh, to me, it's like if you lead somebody and they say, no, no, we won't talk next week. It's kind of like we were talking before. If, uh, if I say, hey, let's talk next week because you're thinking about it, and you say, no, no, not really, not really. I know instantaneously, you're probably not interested, right? It's kind of like how you were telling people, you know, hey, you, you want this done with the software, you know, call me back in about a month, I can get that done for you then. Uh, and then if they don't call you back, they really weren't interested. Yeah, yeah. You know, so, but, go ahead. We, um, in the insurance days, the, the strike rate on the return call was really low. So, <laughs> Because it was only a, it was only a, a, a low cost personal injury policy. Okay. That, you know, it was one of those emotional buys that people do. So it wasn't like buying fifty thousand or a hundred thousand dollar or half million dollar product. It was it was an emotional buy. So when you when you actually started to have that conversation with people, what you really needed to do was keep the conversation going and learn how to keep nurturing the right statements and the right questions. So the conversation kept on going in the direction you needed it to go in, or else. The chances of, oh, I'll come back Wednesday and we'll, we'll resort it out. The chance of getting a sale on Wednesday diminished completely. Now, while it's warm and it's hot and you've gone through that process of opening someone's mind and building up their confidence and belief, that was the really the best time to do it. So really what you wanted to do was every time you were given an opportunity when someone said, look, I'd like to think about it, was your opportunity then to open up and actually not see it as a stopper, even though pipeline, I agree, you've got to have them and they're part of the process. You just don't want to know, right? You either want a yes or a maybe. You don't want to know. Yeah. But anyway, really what you want to do, though, is, is while you've got them in your warm zone, that conversation is to continue the conversation as long as possible to try and get in a constructive way to get mm -hmm. the positive responses. Um, every time someone says, I want to think about it, that's not, that doesn't mean that's the stopper. Right. That actually is another opener. Yeah. That's good. But it's, it's actually another opportunity at the time to continue talking about what you're doing. You know, you go into someone and say, look, I've only got five minutes, an hour later you walk out with a check. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> you know, they've got time if it's interesting. Yeah. You know, they, they want it if it's good enough for them. So it's your job as a salesperson to have that um, rotation of thinking mm -hmm. continually going in the right direction. Because if you don't, look, if someone wants your products or services, well, why not buy it from you? Right. And while you're there, that's the best time yep. to actually get the deal. While you're physically there with them or on the phone, if that's how it's done, if it's done remotely. But while you're in that conversation with them, while you're in the presentation, that is the best time to, to actually get the deal done by a long way. So you, you've referenced this, a couple, referenced this a couple of times and, and I'd like to talk about it is how you would open people up and open those conversations. It, it seems like that was a... Uh, uh, a, a very good skill of yours. So how, talk about that. How did you do that from walking into some of these real estate offices or wherever uh, from cold and opening people up? Yeah, look, I guess it took a long time to get good at opening people up. Um, and a lot of that's just to do with the way you, I guess you first introduce yourself and the way you make them feel comfortable about what you're about to talk about. And I used to use inference a lot. So I used to use inference all the time about, you know, so for, for real estate, um, you know, I'd be talking about what I've done for the other real estate agents and, and how they'd use it really quickly so as a set of inference to why they should look at it. You know, so when you say something to, to somebody like, remember, this is a cold call, not a, 
uh, an appointment. Appointment's completely yeah. different. Someone rang me up and said, come out and see me. Different situation. <clears throat> Although the same things happen in principle because you assume everyone's cold. I got but it. Yeah. When you walk in and physically, you know, out comes Tom Jones, who's the Tom Jones real estate owner. Mm -hmm. You know, it's cold, cold. And you've got to try and at least create the environment and even want to spend five minutes with you. Um, and the way I do that is say things like, well, I believe this will interest you also. Mm. A natural reaction is, well, what is it? Well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> <laughs> you also well, what do you mean I'm glad you asked so all of a sudden they were engaging right and it was a simple one-liner <coughs> excuse me that's all right it was a simple one-liner opening statement you know i i believe this will interest people. <coughs> sorry <laughs> and you also has amazing way of opening them up to, to want to know well, what do you mean mm -hmm. simple i love it simple and i'm not asking a question i'm just making a real positive statement and, and they're then asking me questions. And the more you can get them to ask you questions by making positive statements, the more engaged they are and the more you actually know what it is that they want because they'll ask the questions. So yeah, question asking is very, very dangerous in sales presentations. You really got to avoid them. Unless you know the answer to the question, you shouldn't ask a question. You should make positive statements instead. Uh, what do you mean by that? Where, uh... You can sure. It's dangerous. Describe that a little bit. Well, danger. Like if you, if you, I just did a little video on this the other day to do with closing. Um, but if you ask a, if you ask a direct question to which you don't know the answer to, and they say a negative response back, you, you're buggered. Yeah. I mean, you're really buggered. You know. So um, you know, ask someone. Let's say. Let's say. I don't know. I'll talk about colours. You know. Um, yeah, you know, do do you, and, and there's a red. Let's say there's a red car. Yeah, yeah. You know, and you walk out and say, "Do you like the red car?" And you go, "No." <laughs> Where are you gonna go? Well, you, it's just a dud question, right? And there's a whole series of those questions. There's a whole series of them. You know what I mean? It's far better off to say. Look, it's far better off to say the statement of look, and the car comes in multiple colors. Mm -hmm. Which one do you want? <laughs> right. You don't even have to ask the question because yeah. if you shut up after you make the statement. They'll go, yeah, I don't like the red one, but I prefer the black one or I prefer the green one. I really like the blue one. What are they doing? Well, they might say, they might say, well, what other colors does it come in? Right. What are they doing now? They're engaging and they're asking questions. So you make statements. You don't have to ask questions. You make a positive statement. You shut up. Give them a chance to talk. Two ears. Yes. One minute. So how do you get them to talk is by shutting up. Make a positive statement. Kill and it sounds like the, the positive statements have inferred questions and information in them. Yeah. Just, and, and let the person, let the person go with, go wherever they're going to go with that information. And it can't be a yes or no, red, white, whatever. Right. Let them give you the yes. Yeah. They so, give you the yes. Even though I give you the yes, they'll give you the yes. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. So, <laughs> How would, did that, does that change at all when you're inside an appointment that, that has been set? No, same thing. Nothing, same thing, right to the end. In fact, if you're really good, you'll never actually do a close. I guess, I love it. You, I, the, uh, you don't have to close people. That, that's my, that's my, if you're good, you don't have to close people. You just kind of keep walking. I was a terrible closer. I was really good at I was really good at hearing the yeses. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, That's why I never got strong at closing because I was good at hearing the yeses. So I I I have a firm belief we you know it's I have firm belief we never really close anybody that they decide you have a conversation with them in a way that they decide to move forward. Uh, we can't make anybody do anything. Uh, no, I should not. Yeah. I, I think the best closers are people like yourself, the non-closers is you get good at this and the people just tell you what we're going to do next. They, they, they start selling you on how they're going to move forward. Yeah. And you know, I did a video on this the other day. There's three types of closers. Okay. All right. So there's your test close. There's your soft close. And then there's your hard close. You know, and most people think there's just the hard close. I've got to close, you've got to close, you've got to close. Mm -hmm. Well, your test closes and the way you the way you, you make suggestive statements or suggestive questions, sometimes people just buy off that 
and you haven't even done anything, you know. So, um, in the example I gave the other day in the, in the video that I've, I've just put up on, on YouTube, because my sales videos get a lot of traction, which I'm happy with. Yeah, right. And, um, you know, like, so let's say we get back to the colors of the car. So, you go back and say, you know, a suggestive close, sorry, a test close would be something suggestive, you know. So, you su suggest something like, um, you know, with your, with your colors, for example, you know. So, it, it comes in as a suggestion. You know, it comes in red and green. You know, what's your preference on colors? And then they come back with a statement. And a uh, soft close might be, you know, do you like the red or green? Yeah. You know, so it's a little bit more affirmative. And then it's a, then it comes down to the hard close, which is the, the, you might need to physically ask the question, do you want mm -hmm. the red or the green? So you see the difference? You know, it's gone from yeah. suggestive to like to want. And that's the three different things. So, you know, but I, I'm a big believer in, at the end of the day, you know, when you ask the question, you know, the person says, oh, I don't like red, but I'd prefer the blue. If that's a yes answer, well, that's a yes answer. Right. You know, well, you want the blue? Well, let's let's go and sit down and let's see what we can order. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> let's, see, let's, let's see how far away that is on the pipeline. Let's see if we can get one in, you know. Yeah. Whatever it is, but, you know, that's your yes answer. Right. And that was just off. On, that was just off on colours, you know. So it's a matter of listening and looking for those opportunities. And and if you do enough test closes or test statements, um, you will get enough yes answers, which goes to the Socrates successful method. Did you ever remember Socrates successful method? Uh, no. What is it? Yeah, this is going to be a tongue twister for you. Are you ready? All right. <laughs> <laughs> so and I've I've since modified it, but I'll give you the way I got taught it. So if you ask a question or a series of questions to which your prospect will readily agree, then ask a concluding question based on those agreements, you will obtain a positive response. Oh, I love that. I've, I've since reiterated it because um, I've, changed, I've changed the word questions to statements. Okay. Okay. So instead of saying if you ask a question or a series of questions, so if you make a statement or a series of statements to which your prospect will really agree, then ask a concluding, or sorry, make a concluding statement based on those agreements, you will obtain a positive response. Same, same, same. So, so you're just talking about basically, you know, pacing how, where they're at and, and just moving that pacing into a, uh, a close or a, um, an agreement, if you will. Yeah, and, and giving them the chance to, to buy the product and be yeah. satisfied and actually less buyer's remorse because they've gone through the journey themselves to say yes. And buyer's remorse is a big issue. So if, you, if you're a really good closer, it probably means you're pretty poor in your presentation. Yeah, I agree. You've had a lot of time, you've had a lot of time and effort in the end going, well, you know, let's do the deal, let's do the deal. Well, you start reducing the price or doing something stupid, right? Instead yeah. of selling the advantages and benefits. Um, so yeah, I, I believe the presentation should be strong enough that people just naturally start to say yes, yes. answer and they start buying, you know, can I, can I get this in big or small, you know, can, will it be ready next week? If I say yes today, people ask those sorts of questions. Right. Hey, yes. The, the magic is in the middle. If, and I believe that if you're a really good closer, uh, it's because you messed up a bunch of stuff in the beginning, uh, and, and you're trying, now you're convincing people. Uh, I have a big saying that the, the prospect should convince you why you're going to work together, not you convincing them because it's a much stronger buyer. And all that happens during that, that presentation and, uh, and understanding phase. Agreed. So you said, uh, um, you, you talked about listening here and I picked that up a couple of times. How did you develop your, your listening skills in general, you know, during your, your sales journey? Uh, you use a practice yeah. and you know, what you, when you understand that you are talking over the top of a prospect and you watch it happen and you watch the body language, that's when you learn. Mm. So you've got to be a good listener. You know? And then, like I said, once again, it, was, it came down to teaching it as well. So as I taught people to do it and I'd stand back in these presentations and watch what actually happens, you go, oh, wow, it's so important to make that positive statement and shut up. Give them a chance to talk. Now, did, your, did you develop learning for yourself while you watched and uh, observed other people? Yeah, 
I mean, I um, and then I, yeah, hundred percent. That was when I, that was when I learned the most was when I started teaching, as I said to you earlier, because you start to understand. But I also self taught, so I used to have a, I haven't got an example here, but I used to have a little, I think they were called dictaphones, like a little recorder. Nowadays, you can do it with your telephone, I guess, but yeah. I used to record my conversations and stuff, so I could go back and do my own self training. You know, what was I saying? What was I doing? And I'd record my presentation. This is in the insurance days. I really wanted to know what I was saying because what, what I think I'm saying, what I am saying would be two different things. Yeah, exactly. So I really wanted to record it and listen for myself to teach myself what I was doing. And that made a big difference too. Yeah, that's great. I'm, I'm always looking at my emails. I'm looking at, I'm recording what I'm saying. Uh, I'm, I'm doing the same because, and, and for clients, because you can hear it. Like you can, you can objectively, you can start, uh, you know, seeing it, and, and you're, you're right, salespeople are a lot the same, right? They say the same stuff, they go, they, they um, repeat the same patterns, and it's those that can break those patterns are the ones that have uh, the most success. So, well, listen, Scotty, I appreciate uh, you being on. This was a phenomenal hour of, uh, of your time, and, uh, and I thank you. So why don't you share with everybody uh, how they can find you? Uh, and then um, just so everybody knows, as he shares this, wherever we post this, uh, whether it's an audio or video, you'll be, able to, uh, you'll be able to see the information. So if you don't get to write it down, but Scotty, why don't you share with everybody how they can find you? Sure, the, well, I guess the number one spot was uh, uh, mid year last year, I put up a website. So scottyshindler.com is probably the number one spot. The um, other spot that I put a lot of information on at the moment is LinkedIn because uh, I see there's a nice business platform of people that are there um, striving to achieve and so on. So they're probably the two best ones. So my website, you know, scottyshindler.com with a Y, so S-C-O-T-T-Y, Schindler, um, is the number one spot. And, you know, if, if people want more information, they can reach out and contact. And I, I can't wait to come over your way and do some workshops and share some stories you know, uh, help motivate and teach and inspire some people to go and achieve success themselves. Yeah, well, looking forward to it. I love to uh, have you out here in the States and in Chicago. So um, so everybody watching or listening, connect with both of us on LinkedIn. Uh, that's where Scotty and I met. We both do a, a lot of work there. So hop on over to LinkedIn and connect with, with us. And uh, I appreciate uh, Scotty again for you being on and everybody tuning in to uh, this episode of the uh, On Purpose Growth Podcast. And we'll, uh, we'll see you next time. Take care. Thanks for listening to the On Purpose Growth Podcast. Let us know what you thought in the comment section. For more from On Purpose Growth, go to onpurposegrowth.com. Subscribe here at BLTV for all of our content, including the daily Learn About Law podcast, Seize Your Business, Make Real Estate Fun, and Logical Logistics podcast brought to you by O'Flaherty Law. Thanks for listening.